We are in Luke chapter 19 uh, this morning, and this is the beginning of the end. This is actually the last week of Jesus' life on earth. And so we see now what we've been longing for is the triumphant entry where, where he's making his way to Jerusalem. You know, his whole journey all the way back uh, in the middle of Luke has been focused on Jerusalem. You know, he's been on a mission and he's been heading that way and his goal has been, always will be, was during this time, was to present himself to the religious leaders as the Messiah. That was part of the plan. When he arrived in Jerusalem, he would spend time there teaching in the temple and sharing God's truth, allowing the world to have the opportunity to see him for who he was. Now, the section uh, that we're going to look at is divided into two parts. The first part is you have Jesus entering into Jerusalem. You know, he's on this journey, and he's going to Jerusalem to present himself as the Messiah. We'll see that in Luke 19, beginning at verse 28, and it really goes all the way to verse 44. The second part uh, is where he enters the temple, and he teaches for several days, and that actually takes place between Luke 19, beginning at verse 45, all the way through Luke 21, 38. So this will be, you know, we're not going to see it all today. Today we're just going to see the beginning of him entering into Jerusalem. But as we go through the Bible verse by verse out of the book of Luke, what we'll see is what Jesus was doing during the last days of his life. I'll I'll give you a script of kind of how it all laid out. Uh, This is actually Sunday, and he's heading uh, toward Jerusalem. And, you know, anybody who plans a trip gets ready. Right? If you're going to go on a trip somewhere, what do you got to do? You got to pack. You got things to do. You have preparations to make before you walk out the door. Well, what we see here is Jesus is preparing for his entry. There's a preparation. There's things that have to happen as he's preparing his way to Jerusalem. He's a man on a mission, right? He's going he's to lay down his life for us. So the Bible says in verse 28, and we pick it up, and when he had said these things, He went on ahead. Well, the things that he was talking about was the parable we saw last week. The parable of the minus. Remember that last week? We saw the parable. So he finishes the parable. He makes his last statement. And when he said these things, the next step is he turns and he starts heading toward Jerusalem. Going up to Jerusalem. When when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village in front of you. Where on entering, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. Verse 31, if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he told them. Verse 33, and as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And he said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they sat Jesus on it. Now Luke noted, because this is important, and Luke really wants to speak to the Gentiles. Luke noted that it was now time. All right, And he, he wants you to keep that in your mind. That God has a plan. And that he is always on time. Luke notes that it was time now for Jesus to go to Jerusalem. So he's preparing his way for the entry. Jesus had been to Jericho all the way, you know, we saw that beginning in Luke chapter 18, verse 35, all the way into chapter 19, where he meets Zacchaeus, you know, who climbed up in a sycamore tree. And really, Jericho was a short distance from Jerusalem. So he was in the area the whole time waiting to make his way. At this point, he stops because there's preparations that need to be made, things that have to happen. So before he enters the city, he sends his two disciples to go find a colt or a donkey. You know, a colt can be any male horse or a male donkey uh, up to the age of four. Below the age of four, it's considered either a colt instead of a horse or a donkey. Uh, his command, you have to understand, to the disciples was a fulfillment. 
This was all about fulfilling the prophecy in Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. There was a prophecy about him riding a donkey and coming in as the Messiah. So he had to have this donkey, which displays really his sovereignty. I mean, if you think about it, it displays his deity. How do you send somebody to go do something that you've never been, where you've never seen? So he sends them to go into a town to find a donkey, which he knew would be there, even though he had never been there. So he sends them to find this donkey. He told them what the people would ask, and when the people ask you, that this is what you tell them. So there's one, it's displaying his sovereignty over creation. Two, there's something else that's very important. The disciples believed and obeyed. They followed his word. I mean, it's pretty simple. He said, go, they went. He said, say this, they said that. They did what they were commanded to do. They were obedient. If you believe that he is sovereign, the response is what? Obedience. If you truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if you believe that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords, you respond to his commands. I mean, that's what we do. We follow because of who he is, not because of what we get or who we are, but it's about understanding who he is and why he came. Now, we often think of donkeys as like a lowly animal. But it wasn't that way in the Jewish mind. In, in the, the Jewish mind, a donkey was a beast fit for a king. Go back and read 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 33, where the king sends him on a donkey, sends his son on a mule. Verse 44, same thing. The donkey was considered a strong animal. And the fact that this colt had never been ridden, I don't know if you've ever been on a wild horse before, but it's the ride of your life. And this colt just walked. Never been ridden. Nobody ever sat on it. Which displays Jesus' power over his creation. Sovereignty. An animal that had never been ridden, you know, and yet Jesus sat on this donkey and it led it into town. When, when I was young, I had a horse. And I had this love-hate relationship with this horse. It was, you know, raised him from the time he was born. And his name was Bocephus. I know I don't look like the country kind of guy, but I lived down Zephyr Hills, had a couple acres. I was young, and I had this horse, and I wore a big belt buckle that was bigger than a frying pan. And I wore a cowboy hat, and I chewed Levi Garrett, and I went through this whole phase, you know. And... Uh, during that time, I was into horses, and I had pigs, and my horse and I, like I said, we had this love-hate relationship, because I would chase him around the yard with a dirt bike, and I had a 250 KDX, and I would and just chase him around the bike, and the horse would run, and then I would wait until he'd be asleep, and horses don't sleep laying down, they sleep standing up, and it'd be like 2 o'clock in the morning, and remember, I wasn't a believer, so I would wait. <laughs> And I would just run, and I would jump on his back in the middle of the night, just whoof, grab him. And I was, my body could handle it back then. And he would just go crazy. And it was kind of like a test to see how long I could ride him while he was going hog wild. We had a lot of fun. So Deborah's going to hate me after this, but it's okay. I was not a believer. Let me quote that again. So I was not the nicest guy to my horse. But Jesus had power over all creation that he could get on a mule or donkey that had never been ridden. And it not try to bug, try to bite, try to move. Now Jesus is advancing toward the city. And this next passage is very important. Because it's prophetic and it has meaning for us. Verse 36 says, And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest laying their garments on the road 
and Luke omits the branches, but if you go to Matthew and Mark, there was also branches. Luke just didn't think it was significant at this point. But they laid branches in the road. They laid their cloaks in the road. And it was a sign of royalty. It was a reception for those who were royal. They were acknowledging his kingship, which is very important. Because in one moment, they're acknowledging his kingship. And as we'll see later, they were crying, crucify. They were double-minded. One minute, yay, Jesus. The next minute, kill Jesus. You ever heard the expression two-faced? Yeah. Right? We've all heard that. And we've often wondered, what, what does that really mean? Well, it means to be one way one minute and another way to speak out of both sides of your mouth. And, and there are many believers who say, I love Jesus. But when crisis comes, when trials come, when hardships come, they're like, God, why have you forsaken me? God, why don't you love me? God, why don't you care about me? It's double-mindedness. You know, and James even wrote about that. If you go read the first chapter of James, you know, when they were going through all this persecution, I mean, it was probably the greatest persecution the early church had faced up to that point. And James wrote in the first chapter to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. That's how he starts his letter. These are the Jews that have been persecuted for their faith. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must have its work in you that you'll be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And then he says, if any of you doubt, why? Because James knows that we're back and forth, we're tossed here and there by our emotions, by fear. I worry. That's why we have to learn to walk by faith. These people weren't exemplifying faith. This was emotionalism, sensationalism. And I just want to tell you that you need to understand that because there are churches that feed off sensationalism. It's a rock party, man. You go and it's a concert and you sit through and there's all this great music. And then there's a hyped up message. And it's sensationalism. What it's doing is speaking to your emotion. And even though your emotion is part of your makeup because you have a mind, will, and emotions, it's not the forerunner. We need to live by faith, not by what we feel. And so we have to be careful when we live for the Lord that it's not about the hype. It's about the walk. It's about the way we live our lives every day. This reception of royalty was beautiful. But it wasn't because they believed. Even though it said there was a multitude of disciples, because disciples can mean different things. These were just all followers. They weren't committed followers. These were people who were following because of what they could get. Viewing God as a vending machine. Man, I put my five dollars in, God. Where's my gift? Where's my job? Where's my car? I've been faithful. Look, we serve him no matter what we get. We don't serve him because of what we receive. We serve him because of what he did. He laid down his life for us. He don't owe you anything. He's already offered us eternal life. How much better can it get? No matter what we go through here, and I've said this before, that this life is the only heaven that many people are ever going to experience. But for you as a Christ follower, this is the only hell that you will ever experience. Isn't that good news? No matter how bad it is here, this isn't our hope. This isn't our home. This is the only time that Jesus permitted a public demonstration on his behalf. And he did so for two reasons. First, as I said earlier, it was a part of prophecy. He was fulfilling the prophecy as presenting himself as Israel's king. Zechariah 9.9. 9. Much of this crowd probably didn't understand because you remember, during the Passover, people were on a pilgrimage. People from everywhere who maybe never even saw Jesus or heard of Jesus were all heading to Jerusalem for the Passover. So you had people who were just joining the crowd, Right? I mean, they see all this celebration. It's like a big parade at Mardi Gras. 
You know, like, yeah, what are you cheering for? I don't know. I'm just cheering. Wah! You know, it's like they're just joining the crowd. And it's the same thing here. People are from everywhere, and they're just jumping in. So one, he allows the celebration because it's fulfillment of prophecy, even though most people probably really didn't understand what was truly going on. And they responded, though, which is so awesome, because those who did know were quoting Psalm 118, verse 25 and 26. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. They were crying, Hosanna in the highest. Now, again, Luke omits that, even though that is going on, because you compile the text when you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke together, and you see the full picture. you got to remember what you're doing is just getting a glimpse of each person's perspective for a reason. Each author writes specifically for purpose. So as he's teaching, he's teaching with a purpose. The second reason is that he demonstrated to the religious leaders that he was who he said he was. He was calling them out, forcing them to act because he had to go to Jerusalem and he had to die. And he knew that. And they had tried to arrest him several times. And they had hoped to arrest him after the Passover. They wanted to do it after the Passover. In their mind, he wasn't supposed to die during the Passover. They were going to arrest him after the Passover. Matthew chapter 26, go look it up, verses 3 through 5. So their plan was to arrest him when this was all over. But God had another plan. Because Jesus is the Lamb of God, right? Who takes away the sins of the world. John chapter 1, verse 29. Every attempt to arrest Jesus was thwarted. And the Bible uses a phrase over and over. His hour had not yet come. His hour, every time they'd go to arrest him, the Bible would say, and his hour has not yet come. You can see that clearly in John chapter 7, verse 30. His hour had not yet come. In John chapter 8, verse 20, it's all through the gospel of John. His hour had not yet come. But when it was time, he knew it. That's why he said in John 13, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his what? His hour had come to depart out of this world to be with the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He knew it was time because God's timing is always perfect. Jesus, in the high priestly prayer, John 17, 1, he says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Listen, whatever God is doing in your life, it has purpose written all over it. And whatever that purpose is, is for the glory of God. So look, you might be looking for a job and you can't find one. But God has purpose in that. And whatever trial you're going through, whatever circumstance, you have to understand the Lord's timing is right. Maybe you're being blessed right now. And that has purpose in it too. Maybe you got a better job. Maybe you made more money than you've ever made. Whatever God is doing in your life, it's him who's at work. It's not you. It's God who is controlling and working and moving and the purpose of all things is for his glory. Even the death of his own son. Jesus understood that. My question is, do you? Do you understand that whatever event you find yourself in in life, whatever circumstance, whatever situation, it's all for God's glory. Hard times or good times. Even the pain has purpose in it. And God wants to use it for his glory. We have to wrap our minds around that truth because that gives us confidence to approach him daily, to abide in him knowing that all things 
Like Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for the good of those who love him and who've been called according to his purpose. Why? Because verse 29, those he called, he's predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that we might be in the likeness of Jesus. He is shaping us and molding us all for the glory of the Father. God's timing is always perfect. And we need to understand that. This whole theme was a celebration of peace. People are rejoicing and they're praising and they're shouting and there's this whole festival atmosphere. Luke opened up his gospel by announcing, using the angel's announcement. What did he say? The angel said, peace on earth, right? Peace on earth. Luke chapter 2, verse 14. Do you notice the transition we just read? Not peace on earth, peace in heaven. And there's a transition because there's a purpose. So he starts by saying peace on earth, Luke chapter 2, verse 14. But now the theme is peace in heaven. What the change? Why the change? Because he was rejected as king on earth. And now there can be no peace on earth. Instead, there would be certain bitter conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of evil. Jesus himself said that in Luke 12. There's this eternal conflict because there is no peace on earth. And one of the problems is we're always looking for peace on earth. See, our peace is this way. We should live at peace with everyone as long as it's possible with us, right? That's what Romans 12, 14 says. But there won't be real peace this way because they rejected Jesus. But because of what Jesus did, there can be peace this way, which is so awesome. We can have peace with God, who is seated in heaven, right? We have peace with God because of what Jesus did. Romans 5.1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God. Say that with me. We have peace with God. We have peace with God because of what Jesus did. We are in a right relationship with God. We have been reconciled to the Father because of Jesus. That's good news. We had hostility towards God without even realizing it. We were enemies of God without even knowing it. Yet because of Jesus' sacrifice, we've been brought back together. And that's our only hope. It's our only peace. True peace isn't about what you're going through. And we're always trying to make life easier so that we can have peace circumstantially. You know what we call that? Happiness. Because the word happy comes from the Latin word happenstance. And it's about what's going on around you. So we want to be happy by controlling our circumstances. But instead of happiness, what we all really need is peace. A real peace with God. A peace that no matter what we face... No matter what we go through, we know that it's all going to be okay. That this life is like a vapor that appears for a little while, then it's gone. That's how we walk by faith, because we have peace with God. And not only do we have peace, but we have an appeal to make to the world. That's our message be reconciled to God because of what Jesus did. That should be our proclamation. That's why Paul said to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he said, all this is from God. God did it all. We don't deserve any credit. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of what? That's our ministry. He gave us, as Christ followers, the ministry of reconciliation. The word reconciled means to take two opposing forces and bring them back together. People are enemies with God. Our job is to bring them to God. 
That's our job. We have the ministry of reconciliation through prayer, through the gospel, through serving and loving and guiding and teaching. I love that he says we have the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. God has given us this responsibility. I mean, a part of the whole reason Jesus is going to Jerusalem was to die that we might be reconciled. And then he's now given us, as his followers, the ministry of reconciliation. That's why Paul went on and he said, therefore we are what? Ambassadors. What's an ambassador? It's somebody who represents somebody else. When we think of the ambassadors we have in the embassy over in China or Korea or Germany, they're there for one reason. Well, they're supposed to be there for one reason. They're supposed to be there because they're supposed to be there to represent our nation. They're representing us as a people. That's their job. And what does the Bible say? We are ambassadors. You see, this world is in our home. We're not from here. We're aliens in a strange land. And we are here to represent our Father. We're here to be the light. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. Hear me. Because if we don't open our mouths, how can he make his appeal through us? He wants to use every one of us as we open our mouths to share the gospel. We are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. For our sake he made him who, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We are God's righteousness on earth. And it is our job to be a living witness. That's why Jesus, before he ascended, he said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's your job. That's our calling, is to realize that we are here for one purpose. Hear me. One purpose. To be ambassadors for God. It's our job. It's our job to represent him. So we have to ask ourselves in every circumstance, in every situation, are we representing him? Are we doing our job? Are we allowing the world to see Christ in us? And when we're not, when we fail, man, all we do is confess our sins. But we have to acknowledge that we need to turn and confess our sins. Because 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us unto all unrighteousness. See, we need to keep short accounts so that we're always walking in a right relationship with God. Experiencing that peace that he's given us. We have peace with God because of what he did. That's why Jesus is heading to Jerusalem. That's why they're shouting and proclaiming peace in heaven. Not on earth, peace in heaven. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. The Pharisees knew what time it was. They were seeing what was going on. They're seeing everybody shout. They're seeing prophecy be fulfilled. Everybody lifting up this Jesus, they were jealous, they were upset. They were like, teacher, how dare you? I can't believe you're letting people praise you. The Pharisees wanted Jesus to rebuke his disciples so that would, they would stop calling him the Messiah or the king. But Jesus responded that... If they were to stop, even the inanimate objects, stones, would cry out. That there has to be a proclamation. Because all of history had pointed toward this day. When Jesus entered Jerusalem. The prophets saw it. The people of Israel longed for it. 
and the rocks would have cried out if the people would have silenced themselves. This had to be a spectacular scene. The Messiah publicly presented to the nation of Israel, which God desired, which God put into motion. All the prophecies, all the plans for another purpose, for their rejection. Jesus prophesies over Jerusalem. He weeps for Jerusalem. He laments for them. And when he drew near and saw the city, look what it says, he wept over it, saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Why are they hidden? Because they rejected him as Messiah. Because they didn't receive him. Now, I believe in the sovereignty of God, but I also see responsibility here. We have a responsibility to obey, to trust, to grow. The scriptures tell us to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be, our job is to be responsive to God's work. I see man's responsibility, and I see Jesus weeping over them. He says, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. While the crowds were celebrating and rejoicing, Jesus was weeping. One experience, two different perspectives. Happens to us all the time. People can go through the same thing and respond differently. And the reason we respond differently is because of our perspective. Perspective is everything for the Christ follower. Your perspective will determine your outcome. And so if your perspective is heavenly, you have God's perspective. But if your perspective is self-centered or worldly, you have the wrong perspective. They cheered, they shouted, and Jesus wept. This is the second time in scriptures that the Lord openly wept. The first, of course, was at the tomb of Lazarus, right? Many of your favorite verse. It was easy to memorize. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. So many of you started right there. That's where you got your first in, right? You got that first verse down, Jesus wept. So the first time we see Jesus weeping was over the death of Lazarus. And it was more of a silent, quiet weeping. But here, in the Greek, it's loud. It's an uttered lamentation, like the one mourning over the dead. It's pain. It's grief. It's real sorrow. In this, he was like the prophet Jeremiah, who weeped over the destruction of Jerusalem. Jeremiah 9.1, right? Or go read the book of Lamentations. Man, as he wept for the people of Israel. Jonah looked at Nineveh and hoped it would be destroyed. Jonah 4, kill him. He was upset when God didn't kill him. Wrong perspective. While Jesus looked at Jerusalem and wept. Because it had to be destroyed. Because they rejected him. He knew what was coming. He saw the writing on the wall. Jesus displayed compassion. But he also foretold them of the days that were to come. 
that they would lie and ruin. And that he would reject them because they rejected him. He wept over the city because the people didn't understand the significance of this time, of why he was here. He was right before their eyes and they rejected him. They didn't get it. And everything he said came true. There was a rebellion that the Jews had made against Rome starting in 65 AD, right? Because the emperor at that time had taken money from the temple. And the zealots had rebelled and gathered armies and slaughtered Romans and Romans attacked Jerusalem. And they besieged it in 70 AD. They, they surrounded it. Titus was the leading general. And they starved them. They hemmed them in. Just like Jesus said, you'll be hemmed in on every side. They hemmed them in, starving them. They had no food, no water, and then destroying them, ripping them apart, destroying the temple, just as Jesus said, again, displaying his sovereignty. When Jesus says that something's going to happen, you can know that it's going to happen. I mean, think about when Jesus got in the boat with his disciples. He said, let us go over to the other side, right? And then a storm came raging up, and Jesus is asleep. Why? Because of his perspective. He said, we're going to the other side. He knows we're going to the other side. But they're freaked out. Because of their circumstances. They're looking at the wind. They're watching the waves. Their Lord, don't you care? They're waking him up, shaking him, panicking. Lord, don't you care if we drown? I'm glad he didn't answer that. <laughs> no. Because <laughs> he's the author of life and death. Does it really matter if you drown? I can give you life again in a minute. They're afraid because of their perspective. Jesus said, let us go to the other side. Where are you going? If he says you're going to do something, you're going to do it. Listen, hear me this morning. What does Philippian, Philippians 1, 6 say? That he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. God started a work in you. He's going to complete it. Believe it. Live it. Trust it. His word is always final and true. When God says, who can be against us? He meant it. If God is for us, who can be against us? Neither height nor depth nor anything in all creation can separate us from the love of God. Romans 8, right? 37 through 39. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. He knows what he's doing in your life, and his timing is always perfect. So whatever you're experiencing, there is purpose written all over it. And he is with you in the midst of your trials. It's about your perspective, though, because your perspective will change the way you respond. It will change the way you react. Jesus makes it into Jerusalem. And his first act in Jerusalem. He comes in, goes straight to the temple, and turns it upside down and inside out. I love Jesus. <laughs> My kind of guy. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer but you have made it a den of robbers. Now, this is not the first time Jesus cleansed the temple. This is actually the second time that Jesus cleansed the temple. Once at the beginning of his ministry, John chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. It was the first time. 
the beginning of his ministry. Now he cleanses the temple at the end of his ministry. Matthew, Mark, Luke record only the latter. Neither one of the writers record the former. Only John. John is the only one who recorded the first cleansing. But it's logical that at both the beginning and the end of his ministry, he would cleanse the temple. Being the Messiah, it would be his responsibility to bring ceremonial cleansing to the house of God. So he started his ministry, and he ended his ministry with cleansing the temple. As he was cleansing the temple, he quoted from Isaiah 56, 7, and Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11. He's quoting scripture as he's driving them out because they were selling in the temple. Mark adds, because we need to look at the Gospels together, Mark adds that the buyers and the money changers were also driven out as well. People who were apparently taking shortcuts through the temple compound in their business dealings were also driven out. Mark chapter 11, verses 15 and 16. The religious leaders made money off the system of buying and selling animals for a sacrifice. Thus making the temple a den of robbers. It was all about this. It was all about this. And they also led people into what we call formalism. Right? They led people into formalism where there was this style of worship that wasn't real, wasn't intimate. It was just acted out. A person who would be on a pilgrim towards Jerusalem to make the sacrifice could go to a temple, buy an animal, offer it as a sacrifice without ever having anything to do with the animal. There was no connection There was no relationship. This led to an impersonalization of the sacrificial system. There needed to be a relationship and a cost for the sacrifice. It was a commercial system that was apparently set up in the area, and this is critical, that was designated for the Gentiles. There was an area of the temple designated for the Gentiles. And all this buying and exchanging and selling was set up in that area. Israel's called to be a witness. A witness to the world. To the Gentiles. And here they're bringing them in, making money off of them. How can you be a witness to people you're robbing? They destroyed their testimony before the world, and the whole purpose was to bring glory to God by being a witness to the world of their relationship with God. Look, that's one reason why I'm just going to personally, why we don't take up an offering. That's why. For never. Not since I've been here. Not since... You know, I could have my way. When I first came here, I couldn't. They wanted to pass the plates. And I had to fight and fight because I was like, you know what? If God has your heart, he's got your wallet. If God's got your heart, he owns your money. If God's got your heart, he has everything. It's about him having your heart. It's not about passing a plate or making somebody give or making somebody feel bad for not giving. It's about your heart. It's about your relationship. I don't ever want to be a bad testimony over money. I don't want you to ever be a bad testimony to the world over money. The Jews lost their witness before the Gentiles by turning that area of the temple into a den of thieves. And we have to be careful to remember why we're here. Why are we here? To be ambassadors, to be a witness to the world of who God is and our relationship and our job is to have the ministry of reconciliation. So Jesus' first act in Jerusalem was ceremonial cleansing. And then we see that 
He was teaching daily in the temple. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him. But they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. I'm going to close right here. All the people were what? Hanging on his words. What about you? Are you hanging on his words? Are his words more important than your own thoughts? Than your own desires? Than your own fears? I really want you to think about that. Is his word more important to you? Are you hanging on to every word? Is his word more important than your own ambitions, than your own desires, than your own fears or worries? Because if you're hanging on his word, if you're hanging on it and you're trusting in it, then the response is to walk by faith. That's the response. It's to believe it and live it. Listen, and I'm going to close with this statement and give you your memory verse. One of the biggest issues in the church today, I would say the greatest issue among those who claim to be believers, is unforgiveness. Right? Unforgiveness is one of the greatest struggles within the church, which is affecting our witness before the world. We get angry at somebody, or we get bitter at somebody, or we hold resentment towards somebody. And we're not walking in grace, right? The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 that we should be forgiving one another just as in Christ, that God forgave us. Ephesians 4.32, right? Forgive one another just as in Christ, God forgave you. So when you hold on to something, you're not hanging on to the word of God. You're not believing it. So I want you to think right now as we close. Is there anybody you're angry at, bitter at, upset with? Anybody that you're holding any resentment towards? Because the devil wants to use that to choke the life out of you. But God wants you to be a witness before the world. So bring that to him. Say, Lord, help me to follow your word, to believe it and live it. Because it's your word. Your memory verse for this week? Yeah, that's right. I give a memory verse every week. Uh, every week for the rest of this year, all right, we're focused on living the word. We can't live it if we don't know it. So your memory verse for this week is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to... That's our message. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And we explain how we tell people the gospel. This is our mission, to help people to be reconciled to God. And there's no greater job on the face of this earth. It's the only job that has eternal, <laughs> eternal benefits, right? Every other job you have is temporal. Because you can get fired like that. Or you can lose your business. Or you can, you know, go bankrupt. You can have all kinds of issues. But this job, nobody can take from you. Will you pray with me? Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you, God, for being so faithful, even when we're not. Lord, help us to be more faithful. Help us to be truly trusting in your word. Teach us, Lord, to hang on your word. That your word, God, would dictate what we think and what we choose and what we believe. I love you, Lord. And I know you love us. And I said, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for the peace you give us through our relationship with you, knowing that it's all in your hands. Knowing that we can truly trust you because you are in control. And whatever you do, God, is for our own good and for your glory. So help us, Lord, to believe you, to believe your word. 
In Jesus' name, amen.